Sorry, I completely forgot. Don't worry, I got you. I got you, Cut. Uh, um, so, man, like, um, I don't get it. It's like, didn't get much traction there. Like, I think it, part of it is, is trying to get a clear explanation of what, um, what we're doing. I don't think I did, did it service. Um, no, 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 no. It, 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 the, from my perspective, they're focused on Northern Virginia. They had no prep, basically, for this call. So, like, they didn't know who they were talking to. Um, or, or, like, what they didn't know in advance what we were trying to accomplish here. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I was kind of hoping that my email would have laid it out and explained it a little bit better. But, so, like, Noemi's concern was finding cheaper ways to build. Be and it, it sounds to me like, you know, Habitat is such a huge organization now. Uh, they're just they're uh, cumbersome. Like it, 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 they're a big lumbering ship. And what we're saying is like we can disrupt everything that you're doing and make it in you know. And so, I think I think what I think what she wanted was, would you be willing to purchase a hundred hit houses at this price point over the next you know six months and we can deliver right? Like I think that's what she's looking. And why not? That sounds good, but if they're they're kind of uh, slow in their ways, why would they not want to go regular routes too? Like, why do you see the kit route? Obviously, they responded to it. Why Why do you think the kit route was so favorable to them? Oh, just geographically, because they they don't okay. understand our model of, of sending trained people oh in the OSE you know model and having an impact. Like to them. A person is not a business entity that can have an impact, right? Like, I don't think that's the way that they think. Can you explain it a little bit? Like, obviously, they yeah, think, yeah, yeah. They they think like to get a team. I guess they're thinking, oh, it's these people here. It's not you because we're working with these guys. Or, oh, I mean, I think it's simpler than that. I, I think it's. You're in Missouri. We're in Northern Virginia. How could you possibly impact or solve the problems I have with regards to cost and building efficiency and you know the end product? So, and, and there's like the, behind everything that you're doing is empowering human beings to start their own ventures, where the CD Co Home is a small part of them. Mm -hmm. But that's like an alien concept. Um, and what, what the way that they operate is, like, you're not licensed in Virginia as a general contractor, so, like, why are we even having that? Okay, okay. So, so to, to kind of think, so kind of, like, maybe more bureaucratic thinking, like, as in, okay, if they were progressive, they would say, oh, wow, okay, entrepreneurial activity, we can set up people, we can basically create our own captive workforce like they cannot think that far this might be too much time too much complexity it's just not their model sure yeah all of the above it doesn't address their immediate pop problem that they have to report to their bosses to which is cost from probably it's like yeah that's a great idea for the future but how, how does that help me now well so i was trying to ask them like what would we <laughs> what could we give you right now that that would actually meet your needs because it's like if we say five days and a uh, hundred thousand I think you know it's hands down so where is the disconnect there like credibility it's not real to them. it's not real to them I mean I, I, I think it, it's a combination of things but like if imagine you're, you're Kelly and you you're a project manager or whatever for several different house builds mm -hmm. you're constrained by your mental model for how to build a house right now. And so if we come in and we say, we're going to build a thousand square foot house for a hundred thousand dollars, just like everybody else that we talk about this to, you know, the vast majority of people, unlike Brian Potter, but like he's an outlier, the vast majority of people would be like, well, something's got to get like the inside's not going to be finished or you're, you're not going to have, you know, it's not going to be to the same uh, comparable product standards that exist that we are able to, Okay. You know, and so it's not real to them. I think there's just an inherent skepticism, which is, you know, to be expected. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, 
Okay, so so right now we're we're addressing a credibility problem. Like it's too far out to, for somebody to say that this is even possible. It's really like someone would really have to be super familiar with it and familiar with the various innovations that we bring to the table for them to even say you're not smoking shit here, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd take it a step further and say that, like, you know, it, people like Habitat and even production builders now, I think, and even my neighbor who's a contractor, like, they exist in this world in which uh, a finished house has to look a certain way. And so, like, my contention is that if you if you presented a potential customer with the house that you're currently living in and a production house with the same square footage and you said, you can live in the CD co home for half the price um, and um, have it 10 times quicker, or you can pay the market price for this production home. Now, the differences are going to be it's not going to look exactly like a production home. You know, uh, there's going to be some, you're going to have to adapt a little bit your tastes. And I think they're rationally going to choose, they're nine times out of 10 going to choose a CD co home because of every, the, the value proposition there. But before you get to that point where you can present the two options, people assume that tastes are sticky and that, and people aren't going to be willing to change their tastes and what a finished home looks like. That, that's my assumption hmm. about what's going on here. Like, like the CD go home that you live in doesn't have separate rooms for kids, for example. Or, you know, it's there are, there are changes in people's tastes to like adopt the CD go home as, but like what we're saying as a value proposition is like, would you rather live in a dilapidated place that you have to rent or make some moderate changes to your tastes and live in this great CD go home, right? That's never been done on the market because like people who sell houses are trying to cater to existing tastes. And what we're saying is like, we can, we can potentially change that by making a, a unbeatable, an offer they can't refuse basically. Mm -hmm. How does this logic apply to things like Boxable? Because Boxable is a, you know, a little different in flavor, not your standard house. <coughs> you know Boxable? No, but my guess is that um, Boxable Casita. Yeah, I mean, my, my guess is that there's a small part of the market right now that is open-minded enough to buy something like Boxable, right? But when you're talking to Habitat for Humanity, they're they're dealing with like the most average home buying customer on the market. They're they're dealing with the average taste. People who go to Boxable are like they have already opted into a change or a modification to like what their expectations are, what a house should be. Um, and like I think this is part cultural and generational, and and mm -hmm. it's probably trending more towards the Boxable side or the CD go home side. Um, but you know, it's, I, I think this all reduces down to like things that are new and change the status quo always face resistance to some extent. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I guess that that could explain why, um, you know, we ran into Habitat here and there, just had some communication here and there, but it kind of never went anywhere. I think it's probably be they're, they're working in a much more mainstream world. Even though that they're a progressive organization and you know they're doing affordable housing for uh, people that can't afford houses, um, I, I guess it raises the question. I think it raises the question of like how progressive can you be at the end of the day when you get reach a certain size and have board members to report to, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like at at some point, there's going to be it's going to turn itself into a machine that had you know imposes strict demands on what. It expects, I guess. Yeah, I was surprised. Uh, the funding is not the issue for them. Is that, isn't that interesting? More volunteers. Yeah. More volunteers, for that matter. Right. Um, which makes us say, oh, "How do we do that?" And I guess that's that's because they have a name and they've been around for a long time, right? I mean, there's university chapters like Princeton had a chapter for Habitat and stuff like that, so. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it serves a lot of different purposes. I mean, it's it's uh, attractive philanthrop philanthropically. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. attractive culturally because you know you can create the illusion that you're solving a problem like affordable housing. Wherein it sounds to me like, from Noemi's perspective, the way to solve affordable housing is to rezone 
dense urban, you know, coveted space in cities to multi-unit and, and like, bypass a lot of this architectural review board bullshit um, that's preventing construction from happening. I mean, like, those are the policy changes that would actually impact affordable housing. We know how to build houses cheaper and faster. It's So, maybe you know, that it's kind of a good reason why your model is great because it's flexible to that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, to yeah. do modularity. So for us here in Kansas City, I think the relevant question regarding the third party reviewers, the th- third party inspectors, maybe that is a route where um, maybe mm-hmm. the assumption f- back from the city department was that, oh, it's going to take three days if you get us, but you can actually facilitate that process with third parties. Well, tra- Travis also mentioned that. Yeah, and that's, pr- that's yeah. you know, once we got the same plans, that's definitely something we should talk to him about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I should reach out to him, actually, because uh, I actually want to ask him technical questions, like actually solving some plumbing design issues. Because uh, actually, okay. the, the, we're going to roll out the CD home. I'm not sure if we talked about that, but it's going to have two two bathrooms. And initially, when we started this one, we said, okay, just the bathroom on the first floor, where the second one is an expansion after that. But we thought because the second value, it actually, second bathroom, it actually adds 20% value to a house, typically. It's good to put it in right away so that we have a higher value proposition. And it's true. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if um, what you were talking about, the separate kids' rooms, but here, the the Seagull home, too, that's got the two separate rooms and a bathroom upstairs. So that's... It's. I mean, it, it's not that freaky. Uh, it, it looks right. different. It's like a colonial style, different thing. But yeah, yeah, that's that's nice. Um, I'll reach out to him. Yeah. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Uh, you should be on. on. Yeah. Yeah, I, he would love that. Um, yeah. He. You may just need to remind him that you're connected to me, and and uh, that's that's how that's why you're reaching out. Yeah. Because right? you can just CC on those emails, I think. Yeah. Yep, yep. And he's a pretty friendly guy. He's, um, did you get a good sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great, great dude. He's super passionate about everything that we're doing. Did you talk about the affordable housing issue, like the solving housing yes. problem? Oh, what, yeah. What kind of, what kind of discussion and, was that? Well, I mean, he's just as frustrated with the status quo as everyone else. I mean, he knows that there are, his primary concern is labor, but yeah. in the context of, like he he understands the connection between building the labor force and solving affordable housing and other problems, um, and he's he's like definitely bought into that model mm-hmm. or that that framework, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he's just he just seems like a really nice, well-meaning guy and is very interested to help us out. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'll reach out to him. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well that sounds sounds all right. Um, Mm-hmm. I, I just got an email. Do you remember Jeremy? He was one of the Department of Labor guys that, that yeah. showed up at your house. Yeah. yeah. He just sent us a, an email um, asking if we needed any help with the the tiny home builder apprenticeship. Um, I can resp- would it help you out if I respond and give them both an update of where we are and and yeah. why we're not submitting that right now? Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. Mm-hmm. And then, do you want to respond to Noemi? Um, she also just sent an email. Yeah, I will. And why are we not doing the 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 tiny house thing? Because we're what are we doing? What's our latest? I mean, it, it, it was really because we're not in a position to. It's just like not the most immediate thing right now. It's not a limiting factor. Our ability to because we need to have in order to be an apprenticeship, you have to have at least a year long program. Uh, how does the year-long program uh, reflect? Like, how is that different for the the tiny house? You're saying we're just we would just have to completely redo the the program, right? Oh, well, not as, I mean, uh, the the tiny house idea for the apprenticeship uh, came up because we were talking about like the how do we transition from no infrastructure to being support being able to support the full apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. And we were considering the tiny home or the cabin builds and the workshops and everything. 
Um, and so, like, we could, we could just like the production technologists, we could build a work process and get that approved. That would be very easy, and I can do that if you think it's worth it. Um, we just stop focusing on that because right now we're in like a product development stage, and the CD go home yeah. is actually the first step. Um, and so, like, we're I think just a reality check for us was we're we have much more work to do before we bring apprentices to campus to be apprentices and be, be paid. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, but I'll, I'll CC you and everything. So. Yeah. Yeah. Take that. I'll, I'll respond to. Know any about OC thing? No, that would be interesting just to to let them know. I'm not sure. Um. Yeah, regarding the build model, I, I guess I'm not sure if after talking to you, if they didn't, because we're not ready right now. It's it's probably something that could wait for a little longer. But but I, I can respond to her just saying, hey, this is what we think our value proposition is and why we think that's interesting to you. Um, right. But the <coughs> discussion looks simply like, okay, yes, but simply because um, uh, it's hard to believe that this is possible. Like, okay, we'll, we'll show you once we have a few of these things and the case. Oh, man, yeah. yeah. That's, that's kind of I mean, my gut says like, you, you have if she's gonna put your pitch in front of Habitat International, I would just I would be as authentic as possible because they have people who think strategically, or at least they should at the at the headquarters level. And so, Noemi may not be the right person to hear that pitch, but somebody at Habitat International and shit like at this point, simply having a contact there is super valuable. Oh, you're right about that. That's right. If um, if we're talking about a good organization in the C-suite, depends. Mm-hmm. Depends though, because I mean, I, I'm kind of used to the entrepreneurial world of startups, and there, I would you better believe it. This the the founders and leaders there are typically uh, very hungry. I can't say that for what what that looks like for Habitat. I, I don't have any experience. But my- yeah. My point is that they've got nothing to lose, or we have nothing to lose. I mean, like, they, your plan's already out there. And so if somebody at Habitat, like, they're not a competitor yet. Or that, even if they were a competitor, that in a large, some sense, that would be great because they're going to be proving the model for us at scale. But, you know, nobody's going to your website, taking your plans, and turning this into reality. Like, only you're doing it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that that for today's discussion, the act, there was another dynamic there that is we're com- actually competition, or you you think they were uh, just not seeing it? Just no, I I got the impression that they are um, they're they're deeply concerned about stuff that doesn't really matter to us. Like they're deeply concerned about cost overruns at Habitat, and they're deeply concerned about being able to show property acquisition and, and accomplishing whatever their goal is in terms of like number of houses produced. And, you know, I think going back to like the psychology of it, anytime you say that I've got a way better solution to the thing that you've been doing for the past 10 years, uh, <laughs> people, I think even if they agree with it, that the initial reaction will always be defensive because it's a, it's hard to not be like, ask yourself, like, well, why didn't I think of that? Or how come we're, you know, there must be some reason we're not doing this already if it's such a good idea. Maybe. So I think it, um, would be, it would be fair to say that, well, yes, they're a more bureaucratic organization, but at the same time, it's the psychological trauma. Like Katarina and I here talk about this in a way that, well, if you've been doing something for all your life, you cannot admit to some different or better solution because that would be uh, very traumatic psychologically. It means you've been doing yeah. something wrong your whole life. And that's... Yeah. And, and that's, that's, if, that's if you're raised in a system in which not, ha- not being the person with the credit for the idea costs you something. Like right now, we reward people for... Uh, like Elon Musk for innovating or coming up with a new solution to a long-standing problem, the cor- sword cuts both ways. Then, which is there's like a zero-sum competition to be the person with the idea that gets all the credit and payoff. From it. And if you're not that person, then it's a 
it's a question of status now. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I don't think either of them thought about it that deeply. I just think that they, they're they laser focused on their job and solving the problem that is in front of them. And in some sense, we may just be like complicating their life by introducing this like wild idea that hasn't been proven on the open market yet. Yeah. Um, so like it could be as simple as they just don't have the bandwidth to really think deeply about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Great. Well, I will uh, I'll work on this email, and then, um, oh, I, I did want to bring up, so tomorrow I'm going to be out of town. Um, is it possible to move our meeting tomorrow um, either just go to the next week or move it to like Friday yeah, or Saturday. Next week, that's fine. Next week, okay, cool. Yeah, yep. Great. All right. Uh, any progress on the EV grant? Oh uh, no, no, I've, I've been completely all over the. You house. do you, man. It's not holding us back right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Great. All right. Well, thanks right. for setting up this conversation. That was good. Good learnings, and we'll continue. Yeah. Okay. Give him a love to Katarina. Okay. Thanks, man. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.